Last year, you might be interested to know, the average age of the outstanding young teachers that we celebrated all over the country was 24 years and seven months. Now that means that they don't remember a time before computers. For the whole of their adult lives, they've enjoyed ever-improving access to the internet. Technology is just another altogether natural part of their daily existence. They are technologically fluent, and it's as entirely normal for them to introduce IT into teaching and learning as it was in the old days to use an exercise book and a pen. But I ask you, for how long will these crucial change agents remain in a profession that at times appears quite unwilling or unable to deliver the nature, the scale, and the pace of change that they quite reasonably expect? Every one of them could so easily be snapped up and go on to have golden careers in the private sector. But surely these are the very people who are ideally placed to make a significant contribution to the creation, to the customization, and to the constant improvement of ever more effective learning technologies. Ideas, products, materials that will make the process of learning that much more meaningful, that much more relevant, and that much more engaging, and here's the key, that much more engaging to learners of all ages. Now, as I see it, this will only be achieved through the creation of the closest possible links between people like yourselves and what we used to think of as the classroom. It is these partnerships that will enable us to make real progress in creating and implementing the tools, the technologies, and the practices that we're going to need if we're to revolutionize the way in which we learn. And indeed, in doing so, turn young people's current disengagement with education into a lifelong passion for learning. And I make no bones about, about it at all. At the present, we are losing. Young people are disengaging at the very moment when we need them to optimally engage. Often teachers, communicators, educators, the administrators, the governors, the local authority, uh, the systems and the Department of Children's School and Families don't know as much about the technology as the children do. That's very threatening. Um, so I think that's one of our blocks to moving forward. I will throw in money, but I think it's a red herring. Um, I'm fairly convinced, and I have absolutely no authority to say this, and this does not come from the Treasury, that we're going to need to cut public services by at least 30% in the United Kingdom in order to balance our books. And that's across the piece, and that includes taking some pretty um, swathing cuts at actually stopping some services. So yes, we could use money as an excuse, but if you think of some of the technologies that you're going to see showcased today, how much cheaper is it going to be to deliver a much more enabled technology-based um, education and learning opportunity? But we will use money as an excuse for why we don't do it. We certainly use bureaucracy. By the time we actually got round as a state to commissioning handheld technology, it would be 20 years out of date, let's be honest. How can you have an educational system dealing with the restraints and constraints that were on learning 25 years ago, prescribing the process by which education takes place. And today, where Wikipedia you know, is, is eight times more dynamic and uh, prolific and ubiquitous than the big sort of structured bookshelf of encyclopedias that we had, where everything was on a page, you couldn't erase it, you couldn't add to it. If you did, you wrote in the margin, oh my heavens, you, you, you know, defiled the book by writing in the margins. The world of today is all about writing in the margins, and everybody else reads what you wrote in the margins. Our education system is still geared for a, basically a kind of late 19th century industrial model of production, and that doesn't accord with the realities of our society anymore, and if the education system doesn't keep up, then it becomes irrelevant, uh, and that's a catastrophe. So we better damn well make sure that we do keep up. Nowadays, quality teachers really do look for guidance, feedback, uh, the thoughts of their children. If that strata can carry all the way up from children to teachers to industry and jump in the barriers, then uh, yeah, hopefully the, 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 the outcomes will at least be vibrant, if not effective. So I'm thinking about how technology fits into this. We cannot just assume that technology, the introduction of technology, will automatically equate to really interesting performances in the classroom. Right? And in fact, it tends not to. It's just dumping technology on a population when the teachers don't know how to use it, when the young people don't know how to use it, it becomes another brick. We have to figure out a way to incorporate it into the systems to understand what's going on. 
Um, and technology can be this sort of gimmick or this possibility, this way of getting funding. And it's a very real uh, situation with technology. It can also be an extremely valuable tool that we, we incorporate into the classroom. I actually want to focus on a third way of thinking about this, because I think that these binaries have gotten us into trouble over these years. Technology is fundamentally rupturing many aspects of everyday life. Technology is part of uh, an environment in which we are increasingly networked, and instead of actually thinking about how to, you know, is it good or is it bad within education, we have to take it as it is. It is part of everyday life. It is part of the society that we grow, grow up in today. But many of us in the room didn't grow up with these technologies. But today, they are a part of the reality. They are part of a networked culture that we have to deal with. And so instead of thinking about good or bad in the classroom, what we need to do is think about how we can actually make sense of the world in which we live in, teach young people to think in that world, and to teach them an understanding of how, what these rupturings are about. Technology is going to have a massive impact, I think, and I think that if the government don't kind of get in line with the technology and stuff, it's going to kind of have a, um, a, a negative impact on the education of young people, because young people communicate through technology a lot more now, these days, and even younger than me, than they did 10, 15 years ago, so they are quite advanced in their learning already. So I think that by just utilising what they actually enjoy doing and using it for educational purposes is only going to make a better civil society, really. Um, all popular culture today, from Hollywood and all that that means, television, the media, event, even politics, accepts and goes to great lengths, I think, to promote the idea that it's cool to be stupid. It's a huge problem, whatever anybody says about education today in the Western world, and particularly, I think, in the Anglo-Saxon world. Um, I was born in a culture of necessity just after the war. And today we live far more in a culture of desires. Desire to become famous overnight. Um, life's actual chosen goal. Uh, not to learn, to be intelligent, to gain experience or skills. Um, not to spend time struggling on anything like that. Um, but to simply desire instant success. And hence, uh, what the UK have done is, in popular cultural terms is invent something called the talent show. How on earth, you might say, can a child uh, care about acquiring even an education if the culture itself is determined in making people who have little or, or no education at all feel cool. One of the really interesting things that's going on is that in a lot of schools, the students are beginning to create their own content. And, um, and what a fantastic experience that is, because then instead of pretending to do something, they're doing something for real. They're not, they're not doing a little project which is going to be of no interest to anybody except them and their teacher, they're creating content which is of value to other students. So they're learning about the, the joy of creating something and they're learning about the value of intellectual property and they are contributing to the development of the curriculum. I think technology, gaming and online learning will have a massive impact in aging disadvantaged and disaffected young people. You can ask them if they read books, add to be no, if they participate in computer games or social networking, they spend six, seven, eight hours a day doing that. So why not harness something that they enjoy, have an interest in and use it for educational purposes? In the first weeks of, of Little Big Planet being released, we started seeing such a range of, of, of applications that so many of them being amazing games. And games are really complicated things to do because they are uh, a bit of an art scene that you're creating with a puzzle, with a narrative, with a progression, with interaction. It's really hard stuff to design. And that was actually probably around the time we started to get the first interest from um, from schools and colleges. Um, and this slide we have here is 
an event that we did actually very soon after launching with the Parsons School of Design in New York. Well, that was amazing. Yeah, and they did a they hosted a 24-hour game jam, um, with the point being that to, with the point being to um, have a I guess a winner at the end. But they were using it to sort of try and prototype and using using our game to sort of prototype other game ideas. Um, and it was incredible, and it was like probably one of the first times you were like, oh, All right. wow, yeah, that's, it could be used for that, you know, because we hadn't, we hadn't sort of seen that as that, that wasn't one of the initial goals to get, the, to get Little Big Planet into schools or colleges, but seeing it as a way to help um, people prototype. I mean, you were, you were there. Yeah. When we went uh, there, we, we, they, they basically set up two days to teach different groups uh, uh, the tool, and then to, to, like Siobhan said, have like a little mini tournament. And these are examples of the groups. That was the first time that I saw with my own eyes the dissolving the line between education and, and gaming. These are people playing a game, but they're actually making a project and je uh, d brainstorming ideas, problem solving, writing and drawing things, exactly like a mirror of our process making the game, but sort of uh, uh, minimized in, in two days. And I was looking at it in, in absolute wonder. And I come across schools where there is fabulously good and very focused, hard-edged content being created in the schools, but it's only being used within that school. And you think, if this could be spread on the network for more schools to use it, how much richer would the curriculum be? Uh, and how much more engaging would it be? Because 14-year-olds are pretty good at talking to 14-year-olds. Uh, I've seen some really fantastic work. In education, you always say, oh, the video game is a bit of an enemy because it's terrible for concentration. And and all the rest of it, and, and, and it, to some extent I, I also agree with that. But if you can lock that into learning that actually helps you in the educational process, then that's got to be a 10 out of 10 solution. Johnny goes to school his first day, and the teacher says, Johnny, do you know the difference between ignorance and apathy? And Johnny says, I don't know, and I don't care. She says, you're right. <laughs> Unfortunately, ignorance and apathy are our enemies as much as anything else in our lives. Because in some ways, apathy is worse. Because when you don't care, you don't learn. Being engaged is really the important thing. About 40 years ago, schools with classrooms almost worked. I don't think they do anymore. This is a picture of uh, education in the United States in about the 1850s and last year. Not much has changed. School was the most important and interesting thing that was happening in town. School was a porthole into the rest of the world. It was fascinating. Kids could hardly wait to get old enough to go to school. And yeah, we'd play hooky once in a while, but in general, school was cool. Because the alternative was watching the corn grow, or the river flow. That isn't what we face today. Right now, school, books, not interesting. Because we've got other more exciting things. We've got video games, we've got movies, we've got um, television. Look at the costs difference. Now, you can say, well, costs don't matter. But production values do, and a immature mind can't tell the difference between a crappy idea with good production values and a great idea with bad production values. We have this cliche about us living in this short attention span culture where everything is getting shorter and shorter and shorter. And you know, we've gone from like reading books to magazine articles 
to reading blog posts to reading 140 character Twitter tweets. Um, the culture is getting you know, kind of shorter and shorter and shorter. But in fact, it's really, it's really not if you, if you look at it from a slightly different point of view, right? Think about the time involved in various things. Think about the time involved in reading a book versus playing Civilization versus really taking in the full narrative scope of, of a serial narrative sh show like Lost, which is really a 100-hour show. Um, Sopranos, 100-hour show. You know, there, it's, it's, you know, that's the way that those narratives are written. They're written as a long-form kind of narrative that you're supposed to you know, kind of be able to follow over the course of it. Um, and then think of the kind of daily commitment you get to, to a blogger you follow. Like a blog, yes, is made up of these short posts, but you, know, you end up following somebody and you end up seeing the flow of their ideas over an immensely long period of time. I've been reading Andrew Sullivan for you know, four years now and I've watched this incredible you know, swing in his political values and thoughts about the world. Um, and I feel like I have this very deep, long, engaged conversation with him that is built out of these smaller units. So the time commitment is actually, you know, you've, people spend 40, 50 hours playing a video game, right? Um, so there is actually, one of the things we don't realize, we don't celebrate enough, is that there's a lot of patience out there. People are willing to sit and stay focused and engage with things if those things are kind of designed in the right way. If they aren't condescending, if they aren't talking down, if they're talking up. And then the other thing I, I, I'll leave you with is, um, that's kind of the last great confirmation of some of the things that I was talking about in, in Everything Bad is Good for You is, is Spore, which just came out. Um, how many people have played Spore since it came out? Yeah, so it's, it's worth checking out. Will Wright's kind of latest game, uh, kind of one of the most anticipated games in the history of the gaming world. And, and what you do in Spore is re not just recreate the history of human civilization, you recreate the history of life. You start as a, as a little kind of single-celled creature at, and evolve into a, a, you know, a full creature roaming around looking for food and then you develop a tribe and then you develop technology and then you develop cities and then you eventually conquer an entire planet and then eventually you get the ability to go off to other planets, um, all of which are populated by creatures that have been made by other people in the Spore universe, networked players who are, who are building on their own, on their own uh, computers. So, I mean, there you have, you know, in a sense, all of these things bound up in, in one single game. You have an incredibly complex system that you have to think about systemically. Um, you have an amazing form of participation where everybody is helping to kind of build the, the creatures in this new alternate universe that's happening. Um, and you have an amazing series of interfaces. One of the things that Wright did, Will Wright did in designing that game is that it's basically the interfaces follow the history of video games. So the, the early screen is very much like Pac-Man. Um, and the middle of the game feels like SimCity. Um, and so you're moving through radically different interfaces over the course of playing a single game. And you're recre recreating the whole history of, of kind of life on Earth. And that's happening for fun for kids in their spare time. If you look at who we are as what we, what we are as creatures, we're actually relentless copying machines. We copy. It's how we, it's how we learn to talk. It's how we, it's how we learn. It's how we learn social norms, mannerisms, all these kinds of things. And all our media started to evolve and now information's become a two-way street where anybody can broadcast or receive anybody else's information and it's causing all kinds of decentralization and democratization of lots of industries and businesses and organizational models. And a lot of people look at what's going on and they're scared by this. They see piracy, a threat that we must stop at all costs. I'm sure you all know about pirate radio. It's been, around since, it's been around since the late 50s, and it's been a, a huge cultural force here. So as, as, soon as, I could, as soon as I could carry a box of records, I had to become involved in pirate radio. I was, I was a good kid at school. I didn't get in lots of trouble, but I had to go and do this. I didn't see it as, as breaking the law. I saw it as community service, if you like. I, I saw, it was a community I was part of, and I knew that it was, it was adding value to my life as a teenager growing up here, and I wanted to be part of that. So I spent my weekends at the top of tab blocks like this, in little studios like this, playing, playing all kinds of different music to, to Londoners like myself. And um, the, the police were out trying to catch us, and Ofcom and all the rest of it, but the Metropolitan Police used to also advertise with the pirate radio station I played on. We had such a big audience that for Operation Trident and stuff like that, if they wanted to get through to young Londoners, the people they wanted to talk to were listening to pirate radio. So they valued it as much as, every, as, much as all the record labels used to advertise with us. 
they saw there was value in this even though it was illegal and it was their job to stop what we were doing. And when something becomes popular, a new record, a new, a new sound, a new DJ even, all, all Kiss FM used to be a pirate, most of their DJs, a lot of their DJs are ex-pirates. Same thing with Capital, same thing with Choice. When DJs or records get popular, they're kind of funneled in to the mainstream. So you have the pull of money over here and innovation here. But these two systems really support each other. They kind of form this feedback loop. Teaching for young people in schools is going to change very radically. It's going to become much more customised. It's going to become much more based on collaboration. And it's going to become much more based on a proper exchange of... Uh, or, or the distinction between the supplier and the consumer will begin to dissolve. Consumers will become suppliers. Uh, so it's going to be a much more complicated picture and I'm not too sure that we have got the physical infrastructure that is going to make that transition terribly easy for us. It's the job of educators to prepare students for the world in which they're going to be you know, asked to be productive. And uh, if that world involves all these, th th this collaboration and technology and sharing and customization, and they're not given a chance to experiment with that, to understand it and to progress it in their schoolwork, how are they ever going to be able to deal with it when they get out? Teachers live lives in a very different world from uh, marketing and, and sales. I think industry boards getting together with people from education can only be positive, but it needs to happen a lot more often. We need help to urgently move beyond the focus on access to technology and instead look far more creatively at the potential of the technology. It's very natural for governments to focus on things that are easy to measure. And of those things, those things that are easy to measure, access to technology is one of the simplest. However, that approach risks our moving from a one-size-fits-all model of education to a one-size-fits-all plus technology model. So unless we recognize and fully embrace the opportunities technology affords to transform learning, we will end up losing out. Here's an example. The recent 300 million home access program, which whilst entirely laudable in its aims, raises some interesting questions by equipping less affluent homes with what are termed affordable computers. Rather than by exploring alternative solutions that could possibly more genuinely engage young people in deep learning, that's to say learning through handheld devices, computer consoles and the rest of it, as represented by many of you in this room. In a sense, it's not all that surprising given that the Home Access Task Force comprised a very, very 20th century roll call of suppliers to the UK education market, with little or no representation from, for example, the consumer electronics or the handset industry. No Nokia, no Apple, no Sony. Now why does that matter? It matters a very great deal because I was in a conversation this morning with a, a wonderful headmaster from Phoenix School in Hammersmith, uh, William Atkinson. And William at one point, quite rightly and for very, very good reasons, explained why he will not allow mobile phones in his school. He will not allow them in the school. So I said, well, um, but all the reasons were to do with making phone calls. So I said, well, what are you gonna do as handheld devices become more and more popular and more and more useful in the schools. He said, I don't know. I said, do you think anyone has taken your problem and taken it to the consumer electronics industry and said, what I need is these which cannot ring out or ring in during the school day. This is not brain surgery. It can be achieved, but no one's bothered to take William's problem and have it solved by the consumer electronics industry. Now that's a no-brainer, isn't it? I mean, that's just one example of why if you don't get high-end consumer electronics engaging with the actual day-to-day -day disciplines and problems of a school, you're not going to come up with the right result. I've been bedeviled by this most of my professional career. I've, I would guess, and this is quite, I don't know how I can try and validate this to you, but I would guess that for most of my professional career, I've been working and surrounded by people who are somewhere between 15 and 20 years off the pace. Why? Because decision making tends to be in the hands of people in their 50s who are making decisions that are implemented by people in their 40s on behalf of people on behalf of people who may well be in their teens. And that's been the norm. Uh, but it's exciting and, uh, and it's not all depressing. I think I'm quite optimistic that education and government 
will move much quicker in the future. So you say revolution at varying paces, but more likely to increase in pace than decrease, and it'll become normal. We'll all just learn how to live with it.